Part of I-10 still shut down after an 18-wheeler turned over. Max Massey has the latest on the cleanup efforts. A hazardous situation at a local warehouse. How workers helped to make sure this did not get out of control. And temperatures ramp up today. They'll be even warmer in the coming days. How hot will we go? We'll take a look at that forecast coming up. Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. Lanes of I-10 East are back open, but westbound lanes remain closed about four and a half hours after an early morning 18-wheeler crash. It's still a mess out there. Max Massey joins us live from near the scene. So, Max, what are authorities saying about when this will... Well, we're still waiting for the latest information, but I'm going to tell you this is as close to the crash as we can get. It is just behind me, just a few hundred yards behind me right there at I-10. And guys, the reason we can only get this close is because there are a lot of road closures in the area. Police saying they want to keep drivers at least a thousand feet away from that crash. And that's probably because of the chemicals involved. So take a look. This was the scene from just a few hours ago. The wreck happening around 7.30 this morning. Police responding, even shutting down construction on the highway. Still waiting to learn how exactly this happened and if there are any injuries involved. San Antonio Police Department does tell us that the chemical inside the truck is toluene, a colorless, water-soluble liquid with a smell associated with paint thinners. We're now learning it's racing fuel. Police telling drivers to avoid the area if they can and find an alternative route. As for the timetable of this cleanup, we're told that this could last, this cleanup process could last until at least five this evening. Ursula, David. Thank you, Max. That's going to make the commute a bit interesting. Now to the latest on the coronavirus here in our community. 650 new cases of the virus were confirmed yesterday. According to the newest report from the county, one in five tests for COVID-19 in Bear County yields a positive result. Our total number of cases now at 10,797. No new deaths were reported yesterday. That's the good news. But so far, 109 people have died locally. Right now, 881 patients are in the hospital with 274 of them in the ICU. 154 of those patients are on ventilators. The mayor says half of those hospitalized have no underlying conditions. So far, 3,214 people have recovered. Nationwide, nearly 2.6 million Americans have been diagnosed with COVID-19, and now more than 126,000 have died across the country, according to Johns Hopkins. As ABC's Rena Roy explains, many cities and states are recommitting to restrictions to help slow the spread. Cases of the deadly coronavirus are skyrocketing across more than half the nation. 32 states seeing a steady climb. The hard reality is this is not even close to being over. The worst is yet to come. California's Los Angeles County is the first in the country with more than 100,000 confirmed cases. Mayor Eric Garcetti says one in 140 residents is infectious and beaches will be closed this holiday weekend. COVID-19 is taking control and we need to take control back. So to young people, you are not immune. Officials there trying to avoid crowds like these in Delaware. Three lifeguards now testing positive for the virus. Some beaches will also be closed in Florida for July 4th weekend. The mayor of Miami now fining those violating the city's face covering mandate. You know, it's like COVID didn't exist and people just uh, forgot. And in some cases are still forgetting. Um, you know, they, they're, they're upset that, uh, you know, that I've implemented a mask in public rule. Uh, as mayor of, of a city that's, that's dealing with this crisis, it's a no-brainer. And, uh, and I would hope that, that eventually it becomes a no-brainer in the state. 23 states are facing an increase in hospitalizations, including Arizona, where ICU beds are at 88% capacity. The governor is shutting down bars, gyms, and movie theaters. It will be in a patient's room in full PPE, doing an intubation and I am constantly getting calls about someone else who is in trouble. I think there was a lot of wishful thinking around the country that, 
hey, summer, everything's going to be fine. We have way too much virus across the country for that right now. The nation's top health officials, Dr. Anthony Fauci and the head of the CDC, are testifying at a Senate hearing today. They're expected to warn lawmakers that there will be a tremendous burden on the U.S. healthcare system this fall if there is COVID-19 and flu activity at the same time. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. A new proclamation from Governor Greg Abbott. It's meant to increase hospital capacity in more parts of Texas. The governor says that elective surgeries will be put on hold now in Cameron, Hildago, Nueces, and Webb counties. That's any surgery that is not immediately medically necessary. This is in addition to Bear, Dallas, Harris, and Travis counties. Those areas were told to suspend elective surgeries in a previous order. Firefighters say it may be a few more days before a warehouse near downtown is up and running again. They gave the all clear there early this morning after an overnight ammonia leak. It was on South San Marcos Street in a building that belongs to Kilbasa Smoked Meats. As Katrina Weber reports, firefighters credit workers for keeping it from becoming an even bigger problem. Their response said it all. San Antonio firefighters found a hazardous situation in the 1500 block of South San Marcos. Ammonia leaking from a line inside the Kilbasa Provision Company. Once the gas began filling the warehouse just after 1130 last night, workers found a way out. Initially, when we first got on scene, not all employees were, uh, employees were accounted for because they had left through different exits. Eventually, everyone did turn up. Four employees complaining of breathing problems were checked out by paramedics but found to be okay. The ammonia leak kept fire crews working. They shut it down quickly, then turned their attention to clearing out the gas from the building. We were able to use water fogs to contain that and knock most of that out of the air so that we did not have a plume of ammonia going in any, any business or residential areas. That process took hours. Firefighters were suited up for the trouble and ready for decontamination if needed. What happened in this warehouse had the potential to become a problem for this whole neighborhood. Firefighters say thanks in part to some of the workers, that didn't happen. That was mitigated by keeping the doors closed, which was a good call on the employees' part and we were able to slowly uh, ventilate the structures. The ammonia leak kept the plant's doors closed, at least temporarily. Workers arriving for the morning shift seemed surprised to find out it wasn't quite business as usual. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Now we did reach out to Kilbasa Smoked Meats to find out how this might affect production and what the plan is for reopening, and we're still waiting for a response. Police have arrested and charged a man after he robbed a woman at gunpoint on the northeast side earlier this month. 33-year-old Isaiah Myers was charged with aggravated robbery. The robbery happened at an apartment complex in the 11,000 block of Roselle Street earlier this month. The victim, a 26-year-old woman, told police she was unlocking the door to her friend's apartment when Myers appeared and demanded to know where the victim's female friend who lived at the apartment was. Then police say Myers took out a gun, pointed it at the woman, and told her to put her belongings on the ground. In the report, Myers is accused of making off with the woman's belongings and not the keys. Textile scheduled to hold a virtual public meeting this afternoon. Representatives announcing potential improvements to State Highway 16 near Holotus. Those improvements stretch from West FM 1560 at the Leslie Road intersection to Loop 1604. They would include intersections, pedestrian and drainage updates. The objective is to reduce conflict points at intersections to improve safety and reduce traffic congestion. The virtual meeting set to begin at 5 o'clock this evening. You can participate online at text.gov. More school districts shutting down summer football workouts. Details are coming up in sports. And it's no doubt that the coronavirus pandemic has affected all of our lives. After the break, though, we're going to share a preview of the new KSAT Explains episode and how defining equity plays a part in how the city's path to navigate through the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has been dominating headlines since mid-March when we first reported the cases in our community. And while everyone has felt the effects, it has become increasingly clear that some people have been hit much harder than others. From the digital divide to access to health care, the impact of the pandemic has been uneven in a city. 
That's the topic of the next episode of KSAT Explains that's out this Thursday on all of our digital platforms. Tonight, we're giving you a preview. A lot of the conversation on this week's show will be focusing on equity. But first, we have to define equity and what it has to do with our city's path to recovering from this public health crisis. Here's Mara, Myra Arthur to explain. I think equity has become a buzzword as quickly as it's gained any sort of critical mileage. Karen Cower Baines was the first chief equity officer for the city of San Antonio, so she's familiar with the concept. But what does equity really mean? It's being able to deliver services and programs accounting for the different needs and challenges of every citizen. In this way, equity is different from equality um, in that it doesn't mean sameness. Using what's called an equity lens, our local government would not distribute resources to each of our 10 city council districts evenly. It would actually mean we're accounting for how needs look very different across the community when it comes to specific areas um, of work, whether that's transportation or education or family well-being. So for example, if the city sets aside part of its budget for street repairs, the council district districts with the most streets to repair would get the largest share of that budget. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says San Antonio was actually the first big city in the country to use an equity lens and framework when allocating resources back in 2017. We are by no means even close um, to uh, restoring the levels of equity that would be required for us to have a resilient city. But we have taken the first significant steps before this pandemic and the pandemic has illustrated why we need to continue to, to, to march in that direction. Let's get outside. I guess, I don't know, can you get used to heat and humidity and dust and that sort of thing? Can you get used to all that? Yeah, you're going to have to kind of have to, unfortunately, going forward because we're going to get both. We've got the heat and humidity today and then the dust comes back in some form as we get in Thursday and Friday, the aquifer not doing so great, down half a foot to 661.5 today in the pollen count. We have low amounts of dust, so that's good news for today. Mold is low, pigweed also low, but again, there could be a bit of an increase. We'll talk about that forecast coming up. We've got a lot to watch today, tomorrow, and the next day, um, and a lot of it you can't really see in the air, you just feel it. Yes, uh, a lot going on, and we're sort of starting to move more into uh, a very similar -like pattern, very typical pattern here around South Texas. And one of the big questions we have is, will we hit 100 degrees coming up? It's possible. Uh, let's talk about our first 100 degree day climatology here. We, on average, hit our first 100 degree day around June 26th. So we've gotten past that. The earliest we've ever seen a 100 degree day was 1996, happened in February, February 21st. The latest ever, September 1st. Uh, 1985, but in fact, we've had 23 years where we didn't even hit 100 uh, during the summer, so it can't happen. I, I think we're going to get close as we get into Thursday and Friday. Numbers are going to really start to jump up. Meantime, we've got a couple showers in the radar uh, starting to show up east of Bear County. These are really light. We've seen a couple showers here and there this morning. They're, they're not amounting to much, but uh, you could see a sprinkle or two maybe around Sakeen next 30 minutes or so as this all heads off to the east and northeast. A little bigger picture here. We've had some of the some of those late showers work around Austin to north of Houston. For the most part, uh, it has been extremely light and there have not been any reports of accumulation or anything like that. Uh, we're basically going to keep rain out of the forecast today. But one thing we will see, of course, is the heat and humidity. There are heat advisories posted for uh, the Corpus area and then to our north as well. No heat advisories here. We're just below that criteria level, but I'll tell you, it'll still be hot and humid today to the point where you got to be careful if you're going to be out for any length of time. And those heat advisories extend, extend all the way up into parts of Oklahoma and Kansas this afternoon where heat index values will really jump up. Here's a look at one of our computer models showing the potential heat index later this afternoon. Here around San Antonio, we should close in on 100 about uh, 4 or 5 o'clock. But you'll see the triple digits in a lot of spots. Del Rio, Waco, Dallas, Wichita Falls, Oklahoma City. These are those feels like temperatures and they'll be pretty extreme a little bit later today. Meantime, we're also talking about the dust. Of course, there is some concentration of it in the atmosphere today, but it's been fairly light. There may be a little bit of a haze in the atmosphere today. We will see 
another plume pour in here. It looks like Wednesday night into Thursday, so that should thicken up the concentration some, and you may notice it more Wednesday night into Thursday, maybe even into Friday. So just a heads up. I know it caused some problems this last weekend. It may do so again uh, with this secondary plume. It should die down, though, by July 4th, so there's some good news there. Outside right now, we've got mostly cloudy conditions. Temperature sitting at 88 degrees. We're on our way up. Dew point is at 73. That's a miserable number with it being that high. You're going to get the heat index values already in the 90s, even at this hour. And thankfully, we do have a breeze out of the south southeast that uh, will help to keep us somewhat cool, I guess. Satellite picture shows we've got mostly cloudy skies here in uh, Bear County. Temperatures 88 at the airport, 85 stints, and we're up to 90 already in Castroville. 91 Creasa Springs, a lot of sun there. 89 Gonzales, 90 in LaGrange. The dew points, as I mentioned, have been very, very high. These numbers should come down by late in the week, too. So we'll see a little bit of a change here. But in the meantime, heat index, a problem today. 102 is what it feels like in Gonzales. 96, the current heat index in San Antonio. And 100, the current heat index in Katua. Uh, Futurecast. Shows that uh, quiet conditions throughout the rest of the afternoon, minus a couple of those little sprinkles. And then we'll watch for the potential for a couple of thunderstorms, just like yesterday out west. Places like Valverde County could see some of these storms hold together as they come in from West Texas. But they'll fall apart quickly, and we are not expecting rain here in San Antonio. Forecast for a high today, 94. Heat index will feel like 97 to 100. Already does. Southerly winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. And then 96 tomorrow, 98 Thursday, 99 Friday. That's when we could see some of that haze in the atmosphere. And right now, we're still looking at 99 there on July 4th. I'm not going to put that triple digit <laughs> just yet. Uh, we're going to try to see if we can stay just below that threshold. Staying optimistic. Indeed. Thank you. And hey, we'll let you know how the soccer season for San Antonio is starting to unfold. Coming up next in sports. The San Antonio Independent School District joined Northside, Northeast, and Judson announcing last night that it was suspending all summer strength and conditioning camps on campus due to the rise in the coronavirus in our area. SAISD Athletic Director Todd Howey informing trustees last night that the shutdown is until further notice. Only virtual workouts now allowed starting July 6th. Northside School District spokesman Barry Perez texting KZ12 yesterday confirming that shutdown began yesterday and will last until July 13th at least. That's after both Judson and Northeast confirmed pulled the plug Sunday night suspending all summer camps like Northside. It will be at least until July 13th while they monitor the situation and for Northeast at least through this week. The decision affects as many as 29 schools in the San Antonio area for Northside's 10 schools. Brandeis, Brennan, Clark, O'Connor, Jay Holmes, Marshall, Stevens, Warren, and Taft. For Northeast, seven schools, including Reagan, Johnson, Churchill, Roosevelt, MacArthur, Madison, and Lee. And for Judson, besides the Rockets, it also includes Wagner and Veterans Memorial. And now SAISD, that includes Burbank, Breckenridge, Lanier, Jefferson, Sam Houston, Edison, Highland, Fox Tech, and Young Men's Leadership Academy. You feel sorry for the kids from a coaching standpoint because, um, you know, getting to see them up there, seeing the smile, the smiles on their faces just shows that they missed what everything was going on. And, um, you know, and as coaches, we did, too. It gave us all a little bit of extra, I guess, uh, ins inspiration to see the future and hoping that things get off get off uh, where we are right now. Just a little vacation for July 4th is kind of how I'm, I'm looking at it. And, and, you know, we'll move forward. You know, sometimes you got to adjust, you know, and, and roll with things. And obviously this is a, continues to be a fluid situation. But but again, at the end of the day, I think uh, hopefully everything will turn back and uh, get rolling on the 13th and, and we just cruise on in and get ready for the football season. The University of Scholastic League reopened campuses back on June 8th amid strict guidelines that all schools were instructed to follow. And coaches want you to know that the shutdown is out of an abundance of caution with the COVID-19 pandemic on the rise in our area, not because the protocols were not followed. All the protocols that we had in place worked perfectly. Uh, you know, we had two cases here and uh, removed those two uh, position groups, and and it kind of worked out just fine. Where no one, no one else got ill, so uh, that was important for us to understand that the protocols did work uh, the best that they, the best the way they could. And uh, you know, our kids felt safe. They were they, they they felt like they could come here and be safe and and continue to learn and have fun and and get better uh, and get ready for a season. 
Both Southwest and Medina Valley ISDs have also announced on their Twitter accounts that they too are suspending their strength and conditioning summer camps. For Southwest and Southwest Legacy, that'll be for the rest of the week and for the Panthers in Casterville until July 13th. San Antonio FC back on the practice field preparing for the USL championship season to restart a little over two weeks from now. The USL has shortened this year's season to a total of 16 games, which means SAFC has 15 left on the schedule after their season opening victory over Real Monarchs back in March. They will play in the World Cup style formats, pitting San Antonio against geographic rivals Austin, Rio Grande Valley, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. The short turnaround will be tough, but the team is just thrilled to have another chance to play this year. I would probably speak for everyone that they're just excited to get off the couches, you know, get out of their homes and, you know, get back to doing what we all love. Um, yeah, it's really exciting and, and that it's here now and it's really close. We're really, you know, keen and focused in on every detail that we got to take care of. I think we need to be very grateful because even this situation is very bad for the world. I think we got the privilege to, to keep working and keep doing what we like. Uh, so we, we got to be really appreciate that. And hopefully they'll be able to stay on the field throughout the rest of this season, as short as it is. Yes, of course. All right, coming up, high-tech glove could change the way some people communicate. We're going to take a look at how it works coming up in our next half hour. If you drive I-10 past 1604, we've got some important information you need to know about right now. An early morning 18-wheeler crash still has the westbound lanes closed down, and police say it could be hours before it's clear. Max Massey has been there. He joins us now live near the scene at I-10 just east of 1604. So, Max, how does it look out there now? Well, even five hours after that crash from this morning, that 18-wheeler still spread across the lanes of the highway and the frontage road. I'm going to step out of the way, show you what we're looking at. This is as close to the accident scene as we can get, just a few hundred yards away. And as we can see, fire trucks, police, and hazmat still on the scene. Uh, take a look. This all happened around 7.30 this morning. This was the situation when we first got here. Honestly, even trying to get to the location where we are right now is a struggle driving and traffic-wise. That's because police have shut off a good amount of roads in the area. Police telling us they want travelers to stay at least 1,000 feet away from any part of this crash. That's because of the chemical that was in the 18-wheeler. We're told that it was actually hauling racing fuel. As for when the cleanup is expected to be complete, that could still be here by five this evening. And we are still waiting for the latest information, still trying to figure out how exactly this happened and if there's any injuries. Ursula, David. Thank you, Max. The Louisville Metro Council plans to launch an investigation into the mayor's handling of the murder case of Brianna Taylor. In March, police shot and killed Taylor after they broke down her door while on a search warrant. The committee will also investigate the events surrounding the death of local business owner David McAddy. He was shot as Louisville police and the National Guard dispersed demonstrators during a protest over George Floyd's death. The investigation resolution will be officially read at July 23rd's meeting during that during the council meeting. President Trump under fire over reports that the intelligence community has shared information with the administration indicating that the Russian military offered bounties to Taliban fighters to kill coalition troops, including Americans, in Afghanistan. The White House denies that the president was ever briefed on this matter. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has more. There are new questions about who knew what and when after bombshell news reports alleging the Russian military has been offering the Taliban bounties to kill U.S. and coalition troops in Afghanistan. Overnight, the Associated Press reporting the White House was aware of the intelligence back in March of 2019. And the New York Times saying that in February of 2020, the Russian bounty information was included in the president's daily brief, a book of important intelligence details. House Democrats demand a response. Nothing in the briefing that we have just received led me to believe it is a hoax. The White House continues to maintain the president was not informed of the intelligence and that he still has not been briefed, even as the story has come to light. 
He was not personally briefed on the matter. Last year, 23 U.S. service members were killed in Afghanistan. Whether any were at the hands of Taliban fighters paid by Russian operatives is not known. The Trump administration, meanwhile, calling into question the credibility of the claims. There was not a consensus among the intelligence community. and in, in fact, there were dissenting opinions within the intelligence community, and it would not be elevated uh, to the president until it was verified. An unverified intelligence gets put in front of presidents all the time. It's the nature of intelligence. Families want answers. The AP reports that officials are focused on an April 2019 attack on an American convoy where three U.S. Marines were killed. The father of one of them says even a rumor of Russian bounties should have been immediately addressed. If this was swept under the carpet as to not make it a bigger issue with Russia, I lost all respect for this administration. In an unusual move, the administration only chose to brief a handful of Republicans yesterday, and it's unclear why the administration chose to conduct partisan briefings. Russia, meanwhile, denies all allegations. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. China has approved a national security law that will allow authorities to crack down on subversive activity in Hong Kong. That law sparked fears that it'll be used to curb opposition voices. Hong Kong's leader says it will only target a small minority of lawbreakers. Passage of the law is seen by many as the boldest move yet to get rid of the legal firewall between Hong Kong and mainland China. The European Union voted today to ban all American travelers to the continent over what Europeans see as a failure to make serious inroads in combating the coronavirus pandemic in the U.S. As ABC's Julia McFarlane reports, the EU's list of areas whose citizens can visit includes 14 countries. The list of safe countries that will be allowed entry into the EU has been drawn up by the European Council, made up of all the heads of the government for the 27 member states. After several delays, the group finally adopted this advisory list of who may enter Europe when it lifts its lockdown tomorrow on July 1st. The countries who may visit include Australia, Canada, Japan, South Korea, and a handful of small countries such as Montenegro, Serbia, and Rwanda. Perhaps surprisingly, the list tentatively includes China, despite the communist nation being the global epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic and being criticized for not sharing news of their outbreak more quickly and widely. But China's admittance depends on mutual reciprocity and the Chinese haven't yet said if they will allow Europeans to travel there. One nation not on the list, the US, which is seeing a record-breaking resurgence of infections and where President Trump has encouraged large gatherings and has ridiculed those who wear masks or facial coverings. Also out in the cold, Russia and Brazil. Earlier this week, the World Health Organization announced the global number of cases had reached 10 million, with those three countries making up the majority of infections. And as for Americans hoping to take that long-awaited holiday in Europe, the list of countries is to be reviewed every two weeks. And if the U.S. meets the EU's criteria, namely matching the EU average for new cases and acceptable domestic containment measures, the ban may be lifted in the near future. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Outside with live cam, I snuck a peek over to the little radar. There's like a little bitty blip of something out there. It's green. It looks like there's a cloud on the ground. Is that what that is? <laughs> no. There is a little bit of haze out there. There is a little bit of, of a blip on the radar. We're going to try to make all of this good news because there has been not so great news in the forecast when we're talking about dust and heat. But here you go. Radar does show a couple showers out there. And when I say showers, it's really not much more than a couple sprinkles. But they are there. And they are moving out to the east and uh, northeast this afternoon. You see some of those showers just south of Seguin there. Very light stuff, uh, not really affecting San Antonio. We are not looking for rain today. We do see a little bit of cloud cover, though, and just uh, some partly cloudy skies here around uh, San Antonio right now. 88 degrees at the airport, 91 in Castroville, 82 Bernie Stage, 87 in Tarpa. It's awful humid, too, so there is a heat index. This is what it feels like out there. 96 here in San Antonio, 96 in Port SA, and I do think that heat index could get up to 100 today, so it's going to be pretty unbearable this afternoon. Temperatures, uh, air temperatures at least, make it up to 94, partly cloudy, and then look for partly cloudy conditions going into this evening. There is a little bit of haze out there. We're starting to see some dust trying to work back in here. I think the thicker dust probably uh, arrives later this week. And the good news is it will not be as thick as that last round, but we're going to talk more about that coming up here in just a few minutes. Ursula. Thank you, Justin. NASA trying to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Still ahead, a new product it shared that helps you to stop touching your face. 
And a Grammy Award-winning singer has just what you need if you're searching for some real wine. Details in the spotlight. You already know one of the ways to help prevent getting COVID-19, don't touch your face. You probably realize just how often you do it. So how do you stop? Well, a 15-year-old in the United Kingdom thinks he has an answer. Details on that after the break. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. This is your Daily Tech and Business Briefing from Jetter. The New York Times is ending their partnership with Apple News. Articles from the Times will no longer pop up on the news app. This in an effort to drive readers straight to the New York Times website and their app. Now, an Apple spokesperson says that the New York Times only provided a few Apple News stories a day, and that Apple News will still provide readers with trusted information from thousands of other publishers. Meanwhile, Tesla CEO Elon Musk sent out a company-wide email on Monday calling on employees to help the company break even in the second quarter. Now, Musk urged workers to go all out with vehicle production and deliveries, adding that breaking even is looking super tight right now. According to Refinitiv data, the company is expected to deliver roughly 74,000 vehicles in the months from April to June. Tesla has set to report second quarter vehicle production and delivery numbers uh, sometime before the weekend. And first, they took away our free samples, and now Costco is eliminating its iconic half-sheet cakes due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, over the last month, Costco has quietly stopped selling their 20 dollar half sheet cakes across their U.S. stores. This in an effort to discourage large gatherings. As a replacement, the wholesale retailer pointed customers towards its 10-inch round cake, which serves roughly a dozen people. And that's Chatter Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from New York City. In more consumer news, the international, rather the Internal Revenue Service is not extending the tax deadline. The 2019 tax filing and payment deadline coming up on July 15th. It was postponed from its original date of April 15th because of the coronavirus pandemic. For people who can't meet the deadline, they can file an extension of October 15th to October 15th on the IRS website. Walmart no longer selling All Lives Matter merchandise on its website. America's largest retailer received backlash for T-shirts that featured variations of the Black Lives Matter slogan, including All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, Irish Lives Matter, and Homeless Lives Matter. Walmart says they are being sold by third-party sellers on its website. The retailer has since removed the All Lives Matter merchandise, but the other Lives Matter products are still available. Scientists developing a glove that translates sign language into speech in real time. The goal is to let deaf people communicate directly with anyone without the need for a translator. The Gulf glove rather has sensors along the four fingers and the thumb. They identify words, phrases, or letters in American Sign Language. The signals are then sent to a smartphone app and then it translates all that into spoken words quickly, about one word per second. The UCLA research was published in the journal Nature Electronics. And a teen in the UK has come up with an invention that could keep folks healthier. It's a watch that helps you stop touching your face. Right now, he's raising money for his creation. It's called Vibpro. The watch uses special algorithms to predict when it thinks you're raising your hand toward your face and then vibrates to warn you. The teen says he came up with the idea with his mom in 2018 during the regular cold and flu season, but coronavirus kicked it into high gear. If he raises enough money, the watch could be available by September. He thinks it'll retail for about $110. This guy is probably going to head to NASA. I think so because NASA is trying to do the same thing. If you don't want to wait for that watch to be released, NASA is already coming up with another option, the space agency creating a wearable item. It's called the pulse. When a person's hands comes close to their face, the pulse vibrates. It's meant to help the wearer remember to avoid contact. The CDC not only recommends people to wear a mask, but to also avoid touching your face to prevent getting infected. But NASA in selling pulses. People who are interested in creating one will have to have a 3D printer, wire, and other materials. More information can be found on NASA's website.
I think the young man with the watch is going to end up on Shark Tank one day. That's what I think. That's a pretty cool idea that he had. Um, if he could come up with a device that would get the African or Saharan dust out of the air and wash Ooh. the humidity out and lower the wow. temperature about 10 degrees, we'd be cool with that. That's a big task. That, that, He's that a is smart a smart kid. Task. That's no, a big that's watch. Th would that be? You know, things you never thought you, you would need. You know, five years ago, we never thought we would need something like that, but there you go. Uh, at temperatures today up to 88 degrees, low this morning 79. That is probably a record low minimum temperature for the day, unless we go below that uh, later tonight before midnight. Uh, 94 and 74, the averages 105 and 60, the records set back in 1907 and 1985. There is a little bit of rain in the 7 day forecast. We'll talk about it when we come back. Welcome back. Let's take a look back at history here. Let's go back to 2002. It was on this date, 2002, that we saw at least the beginnings of a pretty massive flood here across South Texas. If you remember uh, that year, we had some rain right at the end of June, and that started things. And by July, we were dealing with uh, pretty bad flooding here around San Antonio, New Braunfels. If you remember, Canyon Lake had the gorge that formed uh, because of the very heavy rain. So this is a sort of a reminder that we can get some heavy rain this time of year, but it is not in the forecast, at least for now. We do have some rain chances as we get uh, closer to the weekend. Meantime, the radar does show a couple of very light showers, and this is really nothing more than a couple sprinkles out there around Seguin. It's not going to add up to anything in the rain gauge, unfortunately, but there is a little bit of cloud cover out there to deal with. And we'll see some partly cloudy skies going into the uh, afternoon. Uh, but at the moment, uh, just a couple showers, no big deal. And we're still tracking some of that uh, dust, too, that could eventually be coming in. Looks like Thursday into Friday is when we may see uh, the bulk of it. But we're not expecting it to be as thick as this last round. So that's the good news there. Uh, looks like it'll be a little thinner in concentration. But let's zoom out a little bit and show you what's uh, going on. Area wide, there are a couple more showers as you get up towards College Station, and these two are very light. Uh, let's take a look at the, the model when it comes to the dust. There is a little bit out there uh, that we're dealing with, that we have been dealing with the past couple days. Uh, and as we get into this evening, there's still probably some there, pretty thin concentration. But Thursday, that's when it gets uh, perhaps a little bit thicker. I know this last round was pretty bad. Again, I don't think it'll be as bad, but if you have asthma, those sort of things, or if dust gets to you, just something to keep in mind. Should start to shrink a little bit as uh, we get into the weekend and uh, July 4th. There's the scene outside, mostly cloudy skies, 89 degrees, dew point is at 72. That number is uh, makes it feel so bad with southerly winds at about 16 miles per hour, but the humidity levels are very high and that's contributing to a pretty significant heat index today. You can see the clouds pretty much scattering out here, so temperatures are on their way up. 89 at the airport, 82 Bernie stage, 88 New Braunfels, 85 in Seguin with a little extra cloud cover there. 91 Gonzales, 88 Kennedy, 89 right now in New Valley. Good breeze out there too. Winds are going to be a little breezy, uh, gusting to about 20, maybe 25 miles per hour into the afternoon. As far as dew points are concerned, they're high today. They'll be high tomorrow, but they do drop off some as we get uh, later into the week. So there's that, but the problem is the air temperature goes up. So uh, it's really sort of a trade off. The feels like temperature this afternoon should be up around 100. Could go as high as 104 down there around Pleasanton, and we should see some pretty big numbers down to the south and west. So be careful if you're going to be outside for any long length of time, at least. Uh, Futurecast doesn't show a whole lot. We could get a couple storms uh, pushing into some of our western counties this evening, but those will fall apart pretty quickly. So it's just places like Del Rio and Eagle Pass that have a chance of rain tonight. And then we'll put it on repeat tomorrow. Actually, a very similar setup. 94 degrees today. Heat index anywhere from 97 to 100. 96 tomorrow, 98 Thursday, 99 Friday with some hazy conditions. Uh, hot on July 4th, and there are the rain chances. Hopefully, we'll get to raise the chances a little bit Sunday into Monday. Guys. Boy, we need some rain. We Thank do. you so much. Mary J. Blige is doing just fine making wine. A look at her new business venture coming up after the break. Paul Reiner, a television pioneer, has passed away. According to his assistant, he died last night of natural causes. He got his first start on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. He also made some big screen appearances and had success as a director. 
Reiner had three children. His son Rob followed in his entertainment footsteps. Later on in life, he returned to acting, appearing as an elderly thief in the Oceans movies. And in 1995, he actually won an Emmy for his performance on Mad About You. Reiner had impeccable comic timing that reflected his philosophy about writing for comedy. He said, if you imagine yourself as somebody really normal and it makes you laugh, it's going to make everybody laugh. He was 98 years old. And in the spotlight this noon, singer Mary J. Blige has just launched a wine collection called Sun Goddess. It is a limited edition collection in collaboration with a winery from Italy. The singer says Sun Goddess, Sun Goddess was actually a nickname her sister gave her because she loves being outdoors and soaking up the sun. So far, the brand includes two wines, a rosé and Sauvignon Blanc. They cost about 20 bucks each. They'll be sold across the country in August. And the 4th of July is almost here, and SA Live has some fun things planned. Today, they're going to show you some family fun crafts for the holiday and share a list of some great ice cream shops around town. Mike? Remember, ice cream? You scream. We all scream for ice cream. Oh, yes. And if you're screaming for ice cream, we have put together a list of ice cream shops that, oh, you won't want to miss. Plus, we had, oh, doesn't that look? Good. Yeah, we head to the final frontier, space the final frontier. These are the boys, sorry. Uh, we revisit a trip I took to the Scobie Education Center and check out the stars. And it's time. Oh, we all need this in the mornings to get your caffeine kick. Circle K is pouring us some iced coffee. And they've got some really, really yummy flavors. And we are getting very crafty for the 4th of July. And some things that you can make at home with the kids. Your own little straw rockets. Ready? It worked. And thank you very much. An applause from the peanut gallery over there. And we want to know what your favorite, speaking of ice cream, ice cream flavor is. Chocolate or vanilla? What do you think over there? Lemon. Wow, that's those are the only <laughs> chocolate or <laughs> vanilla, <laughs> Ursula. <Wow. laughs> and we are gonna have a poll and see which comes out ahead. And don't forget to stream us at ksat.com. That's all coming up in just a couple of minutes on SA Live. So stick around.